Okay. Now you might find yourselves realizing that you are not sharing your video and that you're not able to unmute. And there is a reason for that. This session is a little bit of a different session. Uh, I'll let Dina and Sefra go into the details. Uh, but what they've done here today is uh, gather a bunch of regional experts who work with Ecotype Seed. And this is a bit of those folks having a, a sort of a round table going across a number of issues in detail. Um, and the chat is available for uh, comment and some questions. And I, I will let you know that uh, Sephra and Dina have uh, said that they may or may not be able to get to all or some or any of all comments, but it kind of depends on the flow of the conversation. So you're in a bit of an observer mode. It's a bit of a webinar model uh, that we're using here tonight. Um, so just to be heads up folks, uh, there is a uh, UVM, University of Vermont uh, note taker in the room. And if they would like to uh, acknowledge themselves in the chat, um, they're doing some great work as a team, uh, helping us develop a broad needs assessment understanding, uh, which we're gonna be doing on Sunday. I'll be putting a uh, chat uh, some information in the chat, they will as well into the chat. So uh, we're not doing our usual intro slides because I wanna hand this off PDQ. So I see Ryan Doyle is the note taker. Ryan, if you have that uh, uh, blurb to paste, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, thank you folks for your patience. I'm gonna hand this over to Dina who is <clears throat> now the host uh, and Sephra who is the moderator. Uh, thank you so much, um, and good night. Thanks, Aaron. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much to New York NOFA and all the coordinators of the Northeast Organic Seed Conference and all the folks at UVM. It's been so encouraging to hear all of these regionally based seed conversations that have been going on for the past couple days, and this roundtable is very excited to talk um, about ecotypic seed tonight. So my name is Sephra Alexandra, and I am speaking to you from the traditional territorial lands of the Pagasset tribe, which means where the river widens. And as I was born and raised at the mouth um, of the rivers that feed into Long Island Sound, the land that I was raised on was actually called Matchamux, which means the beautiful land. And growing up there, it sure was beautiful. It's the estuaries where um, the baby fish that proliferate the Long Island Sound, a lot of them are born. There's oak trees and the, the New York ironweeds and the milkweeds, the white wood asters and the yarrows and goldenrods and joe pie weeds, all of these beautiful, um, what are known as native plants. Um, in an effort to help proliferate and ensure that these living seed banks, so the seeds that exist in our local wild soils, uh, were, were able to proliferate, I joined on with CT NOFA as lead of the Ecotype project. Now, an Ecotype, which we will explain further throughout this round table, simply references um, the place-based genetics of that seed, so truly local native plants. These are the heirlooms of our entomological partners in land stewardship, all those bugs and pollinators that help us do this great work of, of caretaking these lands since time immemorial. And so when we think about plants in this ecological context, we wa really wanted to amplify the amount of this seed available for ecological restoration purposes and to reduce fragmentation. So the Ecotype project quickly, we've been working with botanists who wild collect seed, and we'll talk about this whole cycle in much more depth on the round table, and amplify that seed um, on organic farms in founders plots. And then we will collect that seed and clean it and stratify it and do all those fun things. And then give that to the nursery men and women who then make it available to landscapers and homeowners and um, municipalities. So in that effort, I've really had the pleasure of meeting and coming into contact um, a lot of the great seed liberties, as I like to call them, throughout the region who have really been championing this work. Um, and as we realize that in other parts of our country, there really are robust supply chains around eco-regional, which we'll also explain, um, 
eco-regional native plant materials development. But in the Northeast, we have some gaps. So really tonight, what this needs assessment is um, uh, architected to address is where are these opportunities and where are these lacks? So what we're gonna do is we are gonna walk through what that supply chain looks like and have a really honest conversation um, in an effort to begin to fortify a network around this conversation. Now, as Dina Brewster, who I'll introduce in a bit said, this is kind of like roller skating through the Louvre. You know, it's um, the beginning of a conversation. We'll cover what we can tonight. And we're excited at the end to have a survey where um, anyone who wants to stay involved or add their comments will have that opportunity. And we'll do a poll here shortly just to kind of get a feel for who's in the virtual room. Um, and then we will go through a SWOT analysis of what that supply chain looks like. So um, with that, I am going to share my screen and introduce the round table. If you're in speaker view, you can kind of see all the, the co-hosts along the top. We, we look like Hollywood squares at one point, but we, we're all here. Um, and as I share my screen, here we, oh, no, nope, present. Let's see. Um, let's see, I don't know if that worked. Let's try it again, share. Okay, well, well, I'll try that again. Um, Dina, maybe while I'm pulling that up, maybe we can do the poll really quickly and then I can pull that back up. So this is Dina Brewster, Executive Director of CT NOFA. I'll give her a longer bio intro in just a sec. All right, folks, um, as you can see, hopefully popped up on your screen is a quick poll. Um, we're mostly doing this um, not only just to sort of see where we are regionally, but also particularly for our speakers, um, it can be really helpful to get a sense of where the audience is. So we're gonna give this a minute or two. No, not a minute or two. We'll give this another 30 seconds <laughs> for folks to answer. Uh, I'm thrilled to see there's so many on the call. So this may take a minute. And then I will share these results so we can all get a sense of our varying levels of expertise. No one has claimed themselves an expert in the field. Come on. <laughs> Okay, it looks like everyone has answered and hopefully we can now all see the results of our poll. So um, we're sort of operating, it seems like most of the folks who responded are in the uh, novice and curious phase of getting involved with native seed, native plant seed production. Um, and Sephra, I don't know how you're doing, but that is very useful for us, um, certainly as we, as we continue. I'm gonna take a minute just to write down those results. And hopefully that screen has disappeared. Can folks give me a speakers? Can you give me a thumbs up if that poll has disappeared? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. So thank you all and back over to you, Sephra. Okay, great. Let's try this again. Here we go. Can you all see that? Not yet. Oh. <laughs> The joys of Zoom. Um, okay, well, when I go to it, I click on that and I say share. There we go, yep. There we go, all right. How's that? Perfect. Okay, all right. Well, I think you all know that you are at creating an ecotypic seed network in the Northeast. Again, it is a round table needs assessment on eco-regional seed amplification. And I promise we will help define all of those terms that you may not all know as of yet. Um, let's see, okay. So um, it is a pleasure to introduce these wonderful folks 
Um, these are really some of the leading experts and pioneers of ecotypic seed work from throughout the region. So um, I will read a quick, quick bio for each and then you'll get to hear them speak throughout the rest of the evening. So Sarah Tangren, um, uh, who's with the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank, is a practitioner, researcher, and educator who has worked with the flora of the Mid-Atlantic region for more than 30 years. She has worked as an environmental consultant, a local ecotype plant propagator seed producer, a native meadow consultant, and a professional invasive plant slayer. Sarah has designed native gardens and our meadows for the U.S. Vice President's Residence, the University of Maryland Arboretum, and the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She recently, which is an amazing report, just completed a report on the survey of practitioners who use native plants and or seeds um, in the eastern United States. We'll reference that, um, that report and I'll also put it in the chat at some point. Heather McCargo, who is the founder and executive director of the Wild Seed Project up in Maine. Um, she's an educator with 30 years of experience in plant propagation, landscape design, horticulture, and conservation. She was a former head plant propagator at Native Plant Trust during the 1990s and has also worked at several landscape architecture planning firms specializing in ecological design and has contributed to research projects with USAID, the National Gardening, Associ Gardening Association, and MOFCA. Um, she created a wonderful manual for the Maine Department of Transportation, which is focused on restoring native plants to roadside uh, roadsides with seed propagation information for 70 plus species and is the um, editor of a gorgeous yearly magazine that really has um, such informative, helpful images around all of this type of work, working with native plants and perennials and so forth. Um, Hope Jury Leeson, who is a field botanist with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Um, she has 35 years of experience in Southern New England. She's worked for the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, environmental engineering firms, and the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. She has also worked as a contract botanist for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the Rhode Island Refuge Complex, and the Nature Conservancy. She has applied her understanding of native plant communities and plant growth habitats to the sustainable procurement of wild collected seed and native plant propagation. Dina Brewster, who you briefly met, is the executive director of CT NOFA. She has been a full-time organic farmer for 15 years after teaching first in the Philippines as a Peace Corps volunteer, and then in the Bronx as a high school English teacher. She founded the Hickories in Ridgefield, Connecticut, a 45 acre certified organic fruit, vegetable, cut flower and livestock business. Dina believes we have a responsibility to increase the economic vitality of our regional agrarian economy, improve the long range ecological stewardship of our land and water and enliven our cultural commitment to farming. In 2019, she began a local ecotype uh, seed farm at the Hickories, which is where I've been collecting the ecotypic seed. Polly Wiegand is the executive director of Long Island Native Plant Initiative on Long Island. Um, she, um, it's a nonprofit organization that conducts wildland seed collection, banking, and propagation to provide sources of ecologically appropriate native plant materials for use in commercial plant production, landscaping, and restorations. Polly also helps oversee the administration of the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area to further help protect ecosystems from the degrading effects of invasive species. We're almost there, folks. Um, Uli Lormer is the Director of Horticulture for Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts. Um, he's a tireless advocate for the use of native plants in the landscape. Connecting field botany with public horticulture is a professional goal of his and is achieved through his work as a public speaker teacher and gardener. And last but not least, I'm introducing Ed Toth. I pronounced it wrong last time. Um, Ed, uh, who's a wonderful human, is the director of New York's Greenbelt Native Plant Center, which is a 13 acre nursery greenhouse seed increase and seed bank facility in the nation's oldest and largest municipally owned native plant nursery in the US, um, which is in New York. Um, in 2012, he initiated the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank and is currently a member of the Committee on an Assessment of Native Seed Needs and capacity, Capacities of the National Academy of Science. I first heard about um, Ed when I read a New York Times article after Hurricane Sandy, 
where his seed collectors um, had collected this dune grass that got wiped out um, during the hurricane. And it was because they had safeguarded those seeds of that uh, specific population that they've now been able to use that seed to do a ton of coastal restoration um, going forward. So as we talk about the importance of proliferating the living seed bank, um, it is also important to recognize where, uh, you know, um, exit to seed banking, which means in seed banks out of uh, off site from the soil also play an important role. Um, Ed's done incredible work and through his leadership over the last three decades, over 12 million, 12 million plants have been, native plants have been planted in the five boroughs of New York City. So without further ado, I'm going to have Ed kind of set the table for this round table and help clarify a little bit what we mean about supply chains, eco regions, and eco types. So Ed, if you would like to come on, I can stop sharing for a moment. There he is. Uh, I lost my screen. Well, we see you. I can um. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And I can share that cycle if you'd like. Uh, there it's back. Uh, okay. Um, so my job here is to give a little background, kind of set the table for the discussion that's going to uh, ensue. I thought, uh, so, you know, this, the title of the session is creating an eco ecotypic seed network in the Northeast. Um, really what that boils down to, in my opinion, is that uh, uh, in the lingo uh, associated with this enterprise is, is the basically what is the supply chain um, that starts with wild seed and uh, makes its way uh, through all the things that need to happen so that at the end uh, that seed, uh, locally based uh, genetically rich seed is available to those that want to use it uh, in the landscape, either in or, uh, in uh, ecological restoration and natural area land management in agricultural purposes and horticultural purposes. But how do we see that the end users have uh, an adequate and steady supply of, of the seed? And so that network, however loose or organized it is, is what's referred to as the supply chain. And I thought it would be just useful. I just looked up a, a, a dictionary definition of a supply chain, which is um, that it, a supply chain is the network of all the individuals, organizations, resources, activities, and technology involved in the creation and sale of a product. A supply chain encompasses everything from the delivery of source materials, which in our case is wild seed in where it's found in nature, um, delivery of source materials from the supplier, to the manufacturer through it to its eventual delivery to the end user. So that's just a working definition. So of course, what we are concerned with then is a native plant material supply chain. And for almost 40 years, um, restoration ecologists and others have sought to have native plant materials to do their work. Um, and through time, of course, this has expanded, as I said, to include uh, agriculturalists, horticulturalists, landscape architects, etc. Um, but with this origin, we have always realized that um, these native plant materials can't be agriculturally or horticulturally derived. They can't be hybrids. They can't be selections. Um, they need the reason for that is because they need to integrate into the natural environment. They can't be maladapted when we place them out in the landscape. And in fact, they also have to capture the maximum local adapt adaptability um, to the environment that's found in these wild populations. So this uh, material in some sense must truly be local. It must be sourced from and used in a geographically and an environmentally defined, uh, what I will call an eco region. Uh, and so then the desired native plant material product from that ecoregion is an ecotype. So 
we're not just concerned with finding a particular species and using it, but we also want to make sure we're using local ecotypes that are going to be well adapted to the local environment when we put them back out in doing our work. We don't want to be putting plants and seed out there that is maladapted and going to weaken uh, the survivability, long-term survivability of our native populations. Um, Ed, is now a good time to share the eco-regional map for, the, for everyone? Uh, not yet. Got it. Uh, so uh, the supply chain has developed piecemeal over those 30 or 40 years that people have been uh, concerned with having these materials. It, um, so some parts of that supply chain may be well, well developed in certain places. It may not even exist in other places. Um, but it's, I, would, I would say that by and large, the supply chain, whether you're looking at it locally, regionally, nationally, or globally, is severely underdeveloped and very piecemeal. Um, so we are here today um, to discuss what is or is not the state of that supply chain in particularly here in the Northeast where we all live and work and how can we start to get away from this uh, piecemeal nature of the supply chain as it exists and start to build uh, a network, something that, it, that really encompasses all the various pieces of the network. And the various members of this panel are gonna describe the, the various pieces that make up the supply chain. Um, so now, Sephra, you can put the model up. So this is one model of the supply chain. It's a federal model developed by the Bureau of Land Management, um, uh, who uh, might be contrary to what you know about the Bureau of Land Management has really played a large and significant role in, in this discussion over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, so this is just one model, but it's a useful one. And it's the one we're gonna use today as the basis for our discussion. Um, and again, uh, members of the panel will cover each of these six areas and give an explanation of what they entail. The other useful bit of framework that we can use, and if you can put the map up now, Sephra, is, uh, you know, I really want to understand, since uh, my assumption is that most of the 55 people that are listening in are, are growers, um, and therefore are concerned with, uh, I assume you're concerned with the market in which uh, you are going to become a grower and a seller. Um, I mentioned that these eco types exist within eco regions. In a perfect world, these eco regions would, for, would be well understood and developed for every single wild species that we're dealing with, the thousands of species that we're dealing with. Um, but that's just simply not the case. And so what everyone has resorted to are ecological maps that uh, capture a great deal of environmental information and divide the world into eco-regions. And one of the ones, again, a useful eco-regional map that exists uh, was developed by the EPA. And this is the mapping of eco-regions uh, in the Northeast uh, by their uh, work. And again, uh, there are other models and other ways you can do it, but uh, as growers, as we're going through this discussion, part of what I want you to, to envision for yourself is that you live in one of these eco-regions and in essence, um, by the definition of what, of what we say needs to be local and where we would like these materials to be used and therefore grown and marketed, would be in one of these uh, ecoregions. So if you live in an ecoregion 59H, as you see on this, this map, um, we are essentially saying, ideally that would be your market for your product. And so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind as we're discussing uh, all these things. Uh, the last thing that I want to just mention is that, um, uh, in 2018, my Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank conducted 
a survey of native plant material users east of the Mississippi River. And uh, Sarah Tangren, who's on this call as well, thanks to her great work, her hard work has analyzed the results of, of these surveys and we've now uh, published these online. Um, but there were some very interesting things said. So we managed to get 760 respondents from every state east of the Mississippi. 74% um, of all those respondents said that they prefer to use these local ecotypes. Uh, however, only 12 to 15% of them rate the availability of those eco local ecotypes as um, always or mostly commercially available to them. So everybody wants this and virtually nobody can get it, um, not what's truly uh, locally sourced. Uh, by another measure, 85% of those 760 respondents uh, who want to buy their products, their native plant products from within state, in reality have to buy from outside of their state. So if that's your definition of what's local, virtually no one is actually being able, is able to do that. And of all those respondents, the average distance to the closest seed supplier for them was over 400 miles. And the next closest seed supplier was 800 miles. So as I say, you can see that the seed supply chain is really piecemeal um, and largely undeveloped uh, throughout the Eastern United States. Uh, I think the other relevant thing to, to I assume very much so to growers and marketers is that 83% of those respondents said they would be willing to pay a premium for ecotypic seed. Um, so there is also opportunity in this approach, I think, um, for growers um, uh, to uh, get a premium price for, for producing this. And lastly, the thing I will say is that when, when we asked, 75% um, of those respondents only expected the demand to increase over the next two years, 10 years. Um, so, um, you know, the conclusion from all this is that there's a chronic commercial shortage of local ecotypic native plant materials uh, across the Eastern United States. And we want to start working towards correcting that. And so I will finish by asking this question. How do we get to a well-developed native plant material supply chain in the Northeast? I did Thank it, Dina. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, hopefully that helps frame out uh, and lay the groundwork for what we're talking about. I saw Ken Green sign on and his great organization, uh, Seed Shed, has really been having this conversation for a while. And um, how can we create these eco-regional seed systems? And I think now it's really exciting to take that to um, the native plant arena in terms of putting the right plants in the right place. And obviously um, within the attendees here and on this panelist, I'm sure there's a number of different views and we would really love to hear from you all. But if you can take, um, a picture of this in your mind now because I'm going to stop sharing my screen but we'll spend the next hour or so going through each of these steps and talking about uh, really what they mean and the challenges and opportunities that lie within them and um, at the end I will share all these resources with you as well. So first up um, in that supply chain is native seed collection. So Hope, if um, you would like to come off mute and help tell the folks, give them some groundwork about what that all means and, and how we go about that in, in this sense. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so as Ed was saying, the seed collection is the, is the first step in the supply chain. And what we're talking about is wild collection from naturally occurring populations um, to the best that we can determine that. And because there are other sources on the landscape that are um, from other parts of the country um, or um, even hybrids or um, cultivars of the, some of the same species that may have been planted in gardens, there is a degree of trying to find isolated populations that would not be contaminated by this other genetic information. Um, because the, the seeds contain the genetic um, 
information that represents the adaptations of that population. And it's, it's really the, the species best um, chance or best potential for adapting to changes in the future to have as much of that genetic information at the disposal of, of the individual plants. To, um, and so when we're collecting, um, one of the things that we're you know, highly conscious of is trying to collect that genetic diversity because once we as humans get a hold of that seed, we reduce the diversity in every step of the way, um, just because we're growing it under a certain set of circumstances that fits our human needs, our human cultivation practices. And so how we you know, start out with the material is, is really important um, in terms of the diversity that's within, within the collection. Um, and um, so really before this can all begin, there's, um, you know, scouting for adequate populations, um, getting permission because the plants themselves are the property of a landowner. In, so there's a legal reason for getting permission. There's also a social reason for getting permission. Um, you know, we don't want to just assume that we can just go and take things from a, a particular location um, for our own use. Um, so there's this um, social and legal aspect to it. Um, and there's also, as in the supply chain, um, when Ed mentioned the Bureau of Land Management, the Seeds of Success program, which is run through the BLM, um, developed a very extensive protocol for seed collection to try to maintain the sustainability of individual populations so that um, not too much seed, only 10% of an existing population at, that is right at a particular time is collected from, which actually gives you quite a bit of seed, but, um, and depends, depending on the size of the population, obviously, but, um, and there's protocols about how many plants should be collected from and how many times you want to collect from multiple times throughout the span when seeds are ripe. Um, so there are these considerations to make as well as you know what the collection goals might be. Um, and then also collecting data at the site, data about the population, data about the site conditions, um, soil, moisture, light, um, you know, just to have that available in the records that will be kept that will follow that accession, if you will, of seed um, so that anything that might be um, want that we might want to know in the future about it can be um, can you know be accessed, and also uh, uh, we would record the um, the um, the <laughs> the location of it with you know by georeferencing um, the location so that somebody could return to that location in the future um, to collect. So. Um, you know, once you've got your permission and you've and you've gone to the site, you found the site. Um, you know, just um, there may be multiple times when you need to go back, um, and this is where you know really knowledge of the species plays into it um, because you need to have some idea of the the phenology of the species when it flowers, how long it takes from the flowering point to when the seed is ripe. Um, and also what its life cycle is, because many seeds are not, um, they don't tolerate drying out well. You have to know how to store it. Um, so you have to know upfront uh, some information about the species that you're, you're headed out to collect and um, so that you're not just wasting your effort as well as the seed that you've collected. Um, and um, often, you know, if you have to go back multiple times, I mean, one of the things that you end up trying to um, gauge is, is the ripeness versus the um, birds or dispersal get it beating you to um, the seeds. Uh, there's 
a number of particularly fruits on trees that, that birds are actively seeking and they're much better at it than, than humans are. So I will end there and we can go on to um, the next one. Thanks, thanks so much, Hope. Um, while we're um, in this section, and Ed, I see your hand raised. Um, there's also um, a comment in the chat that says, "What about climate change? Would there be more diversity if one included seed from other regions?" Um, they said they're not trying to be devil's advocate, but I, I know Ed, we've had this conversation before. So perhaps um, if you want to make a comment and uh, if you have time, address that as well. Uh. Actually, what I what I wanted to say, and I'm, I, I won't elaborate too much, but I think it's absolutely important that we also recognize that this wild seed is a critical natural resource, um, and for everything that is to fowl, that resource has to be protected. So um, uh, we need, uh, you know, guidelines, and we need an approach to the use of this resource that sees that it, first of all, that the population itself is not negatively impacted and survives. Um, and secondly, that this is a resource that uh, will be sustainable for us to use um, through time without uh, depleting it. So it's a big, huge topic in and of itself, but I just think it's really important to get that message out right up front that this is a natural resource that needs management and, and wise use. As for climate change, it's a huge subject and I don't think we particularly have the time right now, but it still relies on us protecting the integrity of populations, even as they're moving um, uh, in response to climate change. Uh, Great. Okay. Sarah, did you have something you wanted to add to that? I can address that a little bit under evaluation and development. Um, okay. All right. Great. So we will move on to um, the next topic in that supply chain number two, which is evaluation and development. And Sarah, thank you so much. Go ahead. So that was actually a lovely segue. Thank you for the question. Okay, so evaluation and development um, with the more conventional uh, uh, plant materials development is actually cultivar development. So if you were developing a cultivar of a native plant or a cultivar of a tomato, you'd be looking for bigger fruit, you'd be looking for production, you'd be looking for consistency. Um, with native plant cultivars, people are usually looking for height, they're looking for flower size. They're looking to uh, develop plants that human needs as opposed to really fitting in to the local ecology. Um, so the conventional evaluation and development is comparing different accessions, as Hope said, of seeds um, and selecting them for those things that meet human desires. So evaluation and development for native plants is really taken on, for locally native plants, is really taken on a different meaning. And so some of the things that people look at are um, production requirements, for example. It's just sort of what is it that we need to know about this plant material to, to do this job of preserving genetic diversity and still getting um, the site performance that we need to have successful projects. So production requirements, you know, how do you germinate it? How do you uh, produce plugs? When do you plant them? Things like that. Um, plant taxonomy is incredibly important and something we really have lost most of our national um, resources for the botanists, the herbaria, uh, people who are helping to develop the taxonomy within species are actually showing us a lot of this important um, genetic diversity within the species that we're also working so hard to preserve. And you'll see that when they really get in and start digging around within a species, they find variation at the, the variety level or the subspecies level that, that reflects local adaptation. And so that's critical to have that. Um, the ecology of the species, 
how does it, does it cross pollinate? How does it cross pollinate? Um, is it productive when it cross pollinates with closely related plants? Does it have to exist in very large, uh, large populations where it has access to a lot of genetically diverse partners? Or is it actually um, usually sort of a specialist species that's adapted to unusual growing conditions and maybe um, does better with closely related plants as cross-pollination partners. Um, how well does the plant species respond to fragmentation, which I think is a concern that has brought a lot of us to the table uh, in terms of native plant conservation. There's this fragmentation of the modern landscape. There are fewer habitats left for these plants in the wild. How does that plant species respond to that? A lot of plant species um, become inbred and as a result of inbreeding, future generations become weaker, less able to survive, less able to produce offspring. So we, that is, is something that we should know in terms of evaluation and in development. But the, the flip side of that is modern trade practices. Right now we're taking um, seeds of plants from Minnesota and the Lake Erie region and we're planting them in Maryland and North Carolina. And is that too far? And what are the consequences of moving native plants too far? Uh, and the consequence tends to be outbreeding depression when Plants that, while they're of the same species, are just cross-pollinating with other plants that are radically, uh, genetically, their, their evolutionary history has been separate for too long. And again, it results in weak offspring. Um, and, and back to what Hope was saying about wild collecting and trying to capture the genetic diversity in each each uh, species that she's working with, genetic diversity is held differently for different species. For some species, a large percentage of genetic diversity is held within plant populations. And for other species, the genetic diversity is held among multiple plant populations. So what is really the most effective way to get out there and wild collect seeds and Great. get that diversity? Sarah, thank you so much for explaining that part. And if anyone in the audience ever um, needs further help defining any of these terms, you can private message me or put it in the chat and we can address that. And um, also throughout this round table, we can um, try and um, also use real world applicability examples, maybe from our own experience that, will, that can help the attendees relate. Um, I saw that Uli had his hand raised. Uli, did you wanna? Um, well, I, and I'm not sure if this, uh, this question is appropriate at this stage, but um, I think one of the other challenges, as it were, in this supply chain process is the, um, the sort of standards of quality that you would expect from agricultural seed, and that process does not necessarily directly translate to native plant seeds, and that, you know, if you're, if you're looking for, um, you know, 99% germination and, and, you know, this, this, the, uh, a seed that's gone through this evaluation process to come to this point, um, native seeds do not lend themselves to that, uh, that kind of rigor. Um, and I, I, the question I had is whether or not Sarah would want to comment on that, if that was appropriate at this point, or any of the other panelists want to um, uh, jump in on this question. Yeah, yeah, that fits. So different native plant species have different dormancies and the, the dormancy mechanisms also vary according to the ecotype. So not just among the species, but among the ecotypes within a species. So for example, you could be, um, and in fact, there was a study, it was done like in the 1940s, I think, uh, along the eastern seaboard of Seaside Goldenrod. So those of you that are coastal probably know Seaside Goldenrod. And Seaside Goldenrods from Florida have almost no seed dormancy. You can pretty much treat them like zinnia seeds. You add water, you add 70 degrees Fahrenheit and you'll get germination. 
But as you go north along the eastern seaboard, then there becomes this requirement for a cold, moist period uh, to occur. And that cold, moist period, the further north you go, the longer that period is. So right now we have these standards, which is what Uli is talking about, um, where if you produce seed and you clean it, then it goes through uh, germination testing at a lab and they look up in a book. They're like, oh, well, this is such and such a species um, and, and this is how it should germinate and they test it. And if it, doesn't, if it doesn't germinate exactly the way their book says it should, then you get a low uh, germination rate on your test. And so one thing that would be great to have in the evaluation and development phase is accurate germination testing. Obviously, these are not things the growers are going to do themselves. This is really something that our research institution, um, research institutions need to, to be contributing to. And they're not, I think, primarily because there's not much funding. Ed, did you want to add something else? You're on mute. Part of the evaluation that also needs to happen is, um, is for, again, institutions, as Sarah just pointed out, this is not something that individuals are gonna do, but you need to take uh, uh, plants that are sourced from these different populations and you need to study them uh, in what's called a common garden setting to evaluate their performance uh, in a given region. And this is how you start to tease out whether a plant is maladapted to your region or not. And so this is fundamental applied research that needs to go on with all these species um, that will tell you uh, where to source the seed from. So, you know, there are, there are these accepted methodologies for, for evaluation um, where you bring these together in what are called common garden and in reciprocal gardens. Um, and you look and see how they perform and you see what is, what is performing well and what is not. And it, this forms the basis of forming those ecoregional maps um, that I put up at the beginning. Uh, Uli, uh, Uli, we have a, another comment. And if at some point, if someone on the round table wants to give a quick definition of what maladapted and what outbreeding depression is for the audience, that might be helpful for clarifying some of these um, jargon terms. Uli? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to share that the, uh, the Society for Ecological Re uh, Restoration, SER, uh, recently released some um, seed testing guidelines, which I think is a good resource for folks uh, to look into um, because they do specifically address um, this issue that that agricultural standards cannot be applied to uh, restoration materials. Um, so I just want to jump in and, and uh, offer that as a resource. Yep, I have some, I'll, and I'll put that resource in at the at the end. But um, does anyone want to jump in on maladapted and outbreeding depression? Just real. Um, Sarah, I see your hand. Heather, if you're raising your hand at any point, you're a bit off my screen and Polly, sorry, just the way it is. So just let me know. Um, go ahead, Sarah. Yes, so we have not um, answered the question about climate change. So Ed has basically walked us right up to the thresh threshold of answering that question. Um, and it's a very common question, but what Ed was saying is in these common gardens or reciprocal gardens, you can actually see if the plant from this location is performing as well as the plant from another location. And what people find over and over again when they do these common garden studies is that the local plants perform best when the garden is in the area where they co-evolved, right? So with a network of common gardens evaluating uh, at least the most commonly used um, species, native plant species, you will literally be able to see in real time when the local plants start being out-competed by their southern neighbors. And it's, it's, you know, you would think, oh, well, the southern plants are going to do best, but actually a study that was completed in Germany recently 
showed that usually the southern plants do not perform best. The local ecotype plants are still performing the best. Um, okay, well, I think that that is a great segue, unless anyone else on the round table has anything else to uh, mention in this section of field establishment, where um, we will go to Polly in Long Island, who has done quite a bit of that. So. Um, Polly, if you would like to hop on now and help explain that facet of it. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. Um, so the field establishment component is critically important uh, as far as considering where you're going to be placing your uh, plant materials, whether they're plugs or seed, in order to uh, facilitate that increase of plant materials. And in order to do that, we're we're taking, um, you know, in many cases, standard ag agronomic production and applying um, the environmental conditions to produce an ecologically uh, and genetically uh, viable seed that reflects the source populations that we collected them from. And so when we're doing this, we want to, you know, reflect and remember that our goal is each time that we uh, handle the seed or make a selection, we are, we are further reducing the genetic viability um, or diversity of that population. And so in considering um, field production, we need many different protocols in place in order to ensure that we're maximizing that genetic variability within the population that thus informs uh, the fitness of the plants and their ability to adapt and survive in the local environment, um, which is all the reason that we are putting forth such a substantial effort to create this plant material. So the leading one, especially related to uh, growing plant materials from seed is uh, germination protocols. And this is really uh, species and family specific. Uh, you wanna think about whether it's orthodox or recalcit recalcitrant seed on how long, you know, and how you can bank that seed and how you can store it. So species that are recalcitrant don't appreciate being dried down at all, like oaks or maples. And so you need to handle the seed in a different way. Um, in order to store it, but then also how to break that dormancy. So there's physiological dormancy and morphological dormancy. The morphological dormancy tends to be things like seed coats or fruits that um, prevent uh, you know, immediate germination until the conditions are right. And then you have physiological dormancy, uh, such as um, imbibing or reaching certain temperature thresholds um, or actually being exposed to fire, um, smoke, is a uh, chemical uh, trigger for breaking dormancies of many different species. So in this capacity, we use scarification to um, chip the seed coat on many species. We remove the fruits uh, and we also do stratification in temperate areas to mimic the winter conditions and add the moisture so that it tricks the seed into thinking that it's gone through winter um, in a contained environment if you're not doing outside strat seeding or stratification. Um, and that helps to break that dormancy and germination. So some of those germination protocols that you want to think about, while there's seed and species specific, um, you also want to consider how long you may want to leave that seed out uh, of a particular species in order to capture the genetic variability of uh, individuals within that population that may have deep dormancy requirements because the plants protect themselves um, over time by having different uh, levels of dormancy uh, in ideal conditions in which to persist. Related to nursery production, um, again, there's so many standard protocols that we uh, utilize that are derived from general horticulture uh, that we use for native plant production, some of which may or may not be appropriate for the plant materials that we're uh, looking to grow. And that starts generally from working from seed versus taking cuttings uh, to maintain the genetic variability. Obviously, if you're doing a cutting, then you are not diversifying the population. You can actually be reducing the, vi the variability by taking cuttings of the same plant. Um, but use, utilizing seed, um, you know, will provide that maximum genetic diversity. But you also need to consider whether or not you are, what kind of potting material or propagation material you're going to use and what those plants are tolerant to. So species like Asclepius tuberosa, which is butterfly milkweed, um, really likes it to be a really dry potting media. So uh, we find it to be somewhat challenging at times to use your standard 
BM1 or other types of potting soil um, that are, you know, will induce uh, dampening off. So you have to consider in your protocols how you're going to propagate your plants based upon their different cultural needs of them, the disease concerns, um, and also you don't want to be uh, you want to be maintaining that adaptation to the local environment as much as possible. So minimizing any of the amendments that you're using is a consideration. You know, if you want to be, um, we generally use a, um, like a starter fertilizer. And then um, just as you would harden off a species in planting them, also considering hardening off and reducing the nutrients that are provided by limiting the amount of nutrients they need to otherwise survive. Um, within a nursery production facility. So size of containers, the root type, um, all are things that you wanna consider. And I think one thing that's really important to consider, you know, I know this is an organic conference, um, but it's just pest management. So from our perspective with native plants, we're growing the forage species for many of our native plants and um, insects and pollinator species and vertebrates. And so we're innately drawing in many of these species. So for IPM management, you really need to be see on the forefront and, and be a cognizant of if you want to produce seed, then you have to use some alternative IPM management practices to protect your plants. So they do go to, um, to flower and to fruit. So we grew a very bumper crop of, butter, of monarch caterpillars this year, um, which totally defoliated our uh, milkweeds and people don't want to buy milkweeds that don't have any leaves. So um, taking those things into consideration is very important. Um, moving to field production. Uh, this is where you are selecting where you're gonna put your plants. And what you wanna consider there is um, right off the bat, what's already growing there, what invasive species or uh, challenging weeds uh, may be growing. If you're going to be putting in plugs or seed in here, you, especially as um, growing on in an organic sense, uh, you really want to make sure that you're putting those uh, plant materials into um, a somewhat clean field uh, so that you're not going to have competing uh, issues. And also with maintaining the genetic variability of your plants is considering the isolation difference distances of the plants you are targeting for production from the same uh, populations or species of the populations that you're growing so that you don't have um, a wealth of uh, contamination from a local population that can cause uh, the inbreeding or outbreeding depression uh, challenges within the source population that you're trying to grow in your founder plot. Um, just seeing some of the other things. I think also for field production, you really wanna consider deer brows and whether you need deer fencing to protect them. And also same as within the nursery production is utilizing uh, floating rows and other preventative measures to reduce um, foraging by uh, the invertebrates. Um, and then whether or not you're going to need uh, irrigation to establish and what kind of other weed control. So I had the luxury of establishing a founder plot using uh, cover crops and I don't recommend that. Um, there's nothing more uh, frustrating than weed whacking around a thousand little blue stem plants uh, over and over. So the use of weed fabric is critically important. Um, the woven geotextile weed fabric to suppress the weeds in your founder plots um, so that you aren't struggling with both competition and also uh, time investments to protect, protect your crop. So for field establishment, uh, you know, you need the protocols for timing of planting and, you know, what would be the most ideal planting time, just as you would with any other crop and plant material that you're, you would be growing in, in general agronomic sense. Um, and considering the uh, type of plants, whether it's an annual or biennial, whether it's a woody plant or herbaceous plant, and again, whether you need irrigation. So ideally, we suggest um, you know, limiting the irrigation as much as possible to reduce a disease, especially in grasses like the development of rust. Uh, and then afterwards is you know, establishing monitoring protocols to ensure that the species that, you know, the accessions or the representatives of the plants that you selected to plant in your um, founder plots continue to persist so you have that genetic variability. And then also, um, have the protocols in place for the lifespan of your plot because after time, even though you're growing seed, that seed is going to shatter and fall to the ground and you'll have second generations coming in 
and you can increase the likelihood of inbreeding depression. So that's a quick introduction with a lot of complexity and a lot of things to think about. And Thanks, Ed's Polly. gonna add some more. Oh wait, Polly, just, just really quickly, um, just for the audience, would you mind defining what a founder plot is? Sure, a founder plot is the initial uh, plot that you take wild collected seed, you grow them into plugs or you utilize that wild collected seed to establish a seed, seed increase plot. So you're effectively increasing the volume of seed from ounces or grams to pounds by utilizing a predefined agricultural field uh, or location to grow the next generation of plant materials um, and maintain that genetic diversity by utilizing a number of different populations. We use between five and seven at a minimum of any particular species uh, to facilitate that first level seed increase. Great, thank you so much. Ed, before I go to you, um, Dina has something she wants to mention and then um, it'd be great to, you know, through this SWOT analysis, also be looking at where the opportunities are for new farmers coming into this and maybe why there aren't a lot of people who are already doing this, but Dina, um, go ahead. Sure, um, I just wanted to sort of interject because, um, or maybe even just to reiterate what Ed put in the chat is that part of the reason that we're having this conversation um, is so that individual farmers don't have to come up with these protocols all on their own. Um, one of the things I can speak to certainly as someone who is newest in this space and someone who is, I, I, I am, uh, a fruit and vegetable farmer. Um, and I, before that I was a poetry teacher from the Bronx and now I run a 45 acre uh, organic vegetable farm. And when people ask me how I learned how to do all this, my answer is always, I picked up a seed packet, I turned it over and I did what it said on the back. And what we don't have yet for farmers in this space. And one of the reasons that I think my work with CG Nova has waded into this is that we just don't have the instructions on the back of the seed packet. We don't even have the seed packets really yet, other than a few books on this call um, for farmers to join in. Um, and so I just wanted to at least kind of ground some of the conversation in where this network could go. Um, and I think Ed um, maybe wants to riff on that a little bit. Um. I can. I, I was going to say something else, but I, I think, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, you know, I've been growing native plants for 30 years and uh, you never have that guarantee with wild seed of knowing uh, what percent germination you're going to have. I guarantee you it's never going to be 99%, first of all. Um, but environmental conditions uh, at the time you're making these collections from year to year is going to influence germination rates. Um, so yeah, I mean, using the accumulated knowledge of propagators who have done this, and I also find uh, more and more that propagation, and many of you may know this as well, that it, you know it's 50% art and 50% science, and what works really well for one person does not necessarily work well for another. Um, so to steal from others in, in all of these things, I think the other point to make is that um, to do this, it takes a village. Uh, it's no one part of this circle that's, you know, can pull it all off. Um, and, and I think that's the other message to keep in mind as we talk through all these things is that these are all necessary components and, and uh, much of what Polly uh, uh, talked about and um, Sarah are, are going to require the participation of um, significant institutions, whether they're academic or or institutions like Uli's or others that, that are going to uh, do some of the, the supplied science that really is essential uh, and then see that that information is fed to those that are gonna become growers um, because it's just hugely complex. Uh, Right. So I'll leave it at that, I think. And okay, great. I, I think that that's really helpful just to remind ourselves in this needs assessment, you know, what we're ultimately trying to do is form a network. And as um, Ed put in the chat and others have mentioned, what we want to do is have a network so that these protocols and all this information is available as a resource to encourage other seed farmers eco-regionally 
to join in in this endeavor. So um, hopefully as we're working through this native plant material cycle, you're just starting to understand the different nuance that goes into it. And then ultimately, again, our goal is to have this network so that we can all be resources and um, help each other along. So with that in mind, oh, Dina, go ahead. Um, the other thing I would say also, um, and maybe this is just from my own experience, um, I'm a farmer who just started growing some of these plants a couple of years ago. And um, my advice to growers who are thinking, I saw at least in the poll, a lot of folks on this call are, are really new and probably just dipping their toe into this. Um, my experience growing fruits and vegetables is so completely different <laughs> in some ways from my experience working with these plants because I chose some pretty easy species to start with. Um, many of them you will probably recognize as the sort of weeds in your vegetable field. Um, and I think um, I just wanted to at least convey to the growers on the call that these plants have been pretty easy to grow. And I may sort of shock <laughs> some of the PhDs by saying that, but they have not been, and I'm, and I'm new at this obviously, but it has not been um, something that I have, I have felt as a grower, I needed a PhD to enter this space. I mean, these plants are, are really meant to be here and you put the seeds in the ground and it feels like they want to grow in this region in a way that my, you know, Peruvian potatoes may not necessarily. And so you have to struggle with them more. Uh, so I just wanted to like encourage folks at least who are there and thinking of entering this, that it's actually a really lovely and fun and, and not a huge lift to get started. I'm not working on rare, you know, recalcitrant or whatever species, but, um, <laughs> but there, is, there is a way to begin. <laughs> but two yeah, things. Well, um, so there was a question about direct seeding of plants in the field uh, rather than starting them in the nursery uh, in, the, in the chat box. And I would say that's really species specific and dependent on where you are in the production chain. Um, you know, some species like annuals are going to be increased easier by doing a direct seeding and having excellent weed control and then other species that are much more long lived where you're going to really want to be able to track their persistence um, in your founder plot over time. I, you may want to establish, think about considering establishing them from plugs, especially species like warm season grasses that take you know, two to three years to really get their roots under them and get their vegetation growing. Uh, so in that capacity, I, I would say that, you know, it depends on where you are as well. So if you're looking to do founder production and general increase and then the larger bulk increase production, or if you're skipping that step, that will really drive and determine whether or not you are um, utilizing plugs or you're going to do a direct seed. I would say the one thing with the seed is if you mix it all together and put it out in your field, you're not going to know what populations are present in your, um, in your fields, in your production fields. Well, I think um, if everyone else on the panel is good with that, that is then the perfect segue to go to the next section. So thank you, Polly and um, Heather McCargo, if you would like to talk about the seed production side of it, or if you have anything to add on to uh, what was just spoken about. Thanks. Yeah, I think what I'd like to do that would help everyone is walk them through how to sow the seeds, because I have really specialized in teaching lots of people this is not rocket science and that there are plenty of species that are easy to grow. I've done it organically for, you know, I converted the nursery at Garden in the Woods to organic when I was there in the 90s um, and doing it all outside. So I'll explain um, both how to grow, you know, I really recommend not people direct seeding because, you know, unless you've done a really good job of getting rid of the weeds in your growing area, the weeds will grow faster. So I like to have people, so I'm gonna assume that um, the farmer or whoever the grower has gotten their hands, hope collected a nice, you know, a thousand really nice genetically diverse wild seeds that she gave to you. And now you wanna sow them that you're then gonna plant out on your property. And you're gonna have a thousand different individuals from divert, you know, 
at least a handful of different populations. So you'll have the genetic diversity. So what I like to do is have people sow the seeds outdoors in the late fall. You know, that's, you know, one of the things that freaks people out about native seed sowing is does it need a cold period? Does it not need one? Does it need one month? Does it need three months? Does it need five months? You don't have to worry about any of that if you just sow the seeds outdoors in late fall or even winter. I recommend people do it in flats or pots. You can do it directly into plug trays, but that has some risks in that the plug trays when for seed sowing, it's a little harder to get as um, high a germination because I don't know, the little cells are harder. So I like to get people to sow all the seeds in a flat or pot, use good organic potting soil. If you're sowing something like butterfly milkweed, then cut that soil 50% with sand. You know, that's one of the biggest differences of native seeds. They don't need all the high nutrients of what you know, a really good organic vegetable gardener knows that your trick to getting really good broccoli or lettuce is gobs of compost. Well, our native species just don't need those high nutrient levels. So you sow the seeds outdoors um, in the fall or early winter, you can still do it now, cover them with coarse sand. Um, you then have to protect them from rodents. So put some wire over it, and then the seeds will start germinating in the spring. They'll be really well hydrated from all the winter weather, whether it's rain or snow or ice, and that freeze and thaw really helps break down a heavy seed coat. You sow the seeds really densely, like where each seed is, you know, an eighth of an inch apart. You know, I like to say that native seeds are like teenagers. I swear they germinate better. If you took, you know, if you planted one aster seed, it won't germinate. If you plant 20 together, they'll all germinate. There's just something about them that comes in with the art, Ed, like you were talking about. Um, and then it's really interesting to see when the different species germinate in the spring. Stump start as early as in March when it's still regularly dipping below freezing. Um, and even species like asters that don't need a winter cold period to germinate, they're some of the earliest to germinate in the spring when it's still really cold. Then other species wait until it's really the heat of summer comes, like Jack and Lepulpa is an example of that. Now that is mostly a tropical family. Even bunchberry, which is a you know circumboreal plant that really likes cool weather, that one waits until June to germinate. So there's huge variation. And when you do it outside, you know, you let that seed and its own timetable determine the right time to germinate. And then I like to have people grow those juvenile plants on through the summer and wait and plant them out in the field. So if you were trying to establish this founder plot, you would sow those 100 seed You'd grow them on, you'd, you'd need to move them into bigger pots over the summer to let them grow and then divide them up. And, and you'd have that whole summer where you could have chosen where your founder plot was gonna be, put down either black plastic or cardboard and mulch and smother the area so that you have a nice weed-free area that you can then plant those juveniles out in sometime later in September once the heat of summer is gone. And those, you will have really good germination. You'll end up with a lot of plants. And then, you know, let's say it was New England Aster or Joe Pie Weed. That second summer, you'll probably get some blossoms, but really you won't get serious seeds from those plants until the following, till the third summer. Um, the other thing is then how would you, you know, get hand harvest that seed then in the coming years with that plot. Let's pretend Sarah that it, or um, Polly that it got mowed around it so that you don't have seedlings germinating on the ground next to it. So you're sticking with those mother plants. Um, you know, is harvest, you know, going through the and harvesting them over a couple week period, um, not just choosing one time to cut them all back and harvest them. And you know, the easier to 
you know, judge when they're ripe species like the asters or milkweed. It's still, they don't all ripen at once. So you really want to do be able to pass through the plot a couple of times to get a variety of even individuals when their seeds ripen. So if you only harvested them once at the end of the season or early in the season, you would be favoring either, either the you know, earlier ripening ones or the later ripening ones. So again, to try to mimic nature more and not focus on um, human needs too much. Um, the other things that were on my list, Sephra, were to talk about marketing. Now, I think the real challenge is going to be for, you know, I think a grower could potentially, you know, like Dina, you know, look at your site and what kind of soil you have and choose like, uh, you know, 10 or, you know, maybe 10 species that you want to have these plots of that you could harvest the seed of, but it takes a lot of seed to get a pound, like a ton of plants. So this is where the challenge comes in with trying to sell bulk seed. There is no money in bulk seed. This is the reason Ernst and these huge companies uh, have dominated the market. You know, um, they are can so undercut the price by mass producing uh, in, inferior products. So I think for people to earn any revenue on it, they're gonna need to sell, you know, it as individual packages. Yeah, Ed? Go ahead, Ed. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, a huge part of the need is for large quantities for ecological restoration and land management. So, um, if that's where we're stuck, we're never going to meet those needs. Uh, you know, part of the answer is that Ernst does not uh, have eco-regional eco seed for, for most of the areas in the United States. Ernst's model is to sell their seed to anybody anywhere. They'll sell their seed uh, to another continent if somebody wants to buy it. Um, so, but we're talking and we don't have a lot of seed out there. It's much more efficient use of our limited native seed to grow juvenile plants and get more of the restoration happening that way. Because when you broadcast seed, most of that seed doesn't land somewhere and germinate and become another plant. Most of it gets you know, blown away or lands where it won't germinate or it gets eaten by a bird or a rodent. Yeah, but if you're, if you're working, if you're working on 10 acres of restoration, um, you're not going to be, it's not going to be cost effective um, to put live plants out over 10 acres. And so many, many, you know, uh, state, uh, I mean, for instance, we'd love to get state DOTs doing eco-regional plantings along right-of-ways. Um, you know, for, for pollinator management, uh, et cetera. And it's just not going to be economically uh, possible to do it from live plants alone. There, there is a methodology to, to go through increases. And, um, uh, you know, there's an, there is an economy. I mean, um, the DOT would, if they stopped mowing all the native plants, they would that, you know, if I look in Maine, where when the little blue stems blooming, or not blooming, ripening, that's when they mow it away instead of letting it disperse. Yeah, but, you know, the DOT does road projects. They rip up the sides of the road um, and do road projects, and they need to revegetate them. And yes, sometimes that, you know, that may be totally possible. But, you know, for no other reason, I, I would argue that these large, first of all, I would argue as, you know, I, I feed plants into a large bureaucracy, the city of New York, and we, we have large needs. And there are, you know, all the federal agencies, state agencies, all desperately uh, in need of and wanting ecotypical seed. If nothing else, I, I would say to growers that these are potential markets um, for your product. Uh, and so part of what I feel needs to be done in the, and that we've talked about is connecting um, the growers with those potential markets and make, doing a good job of seeing that 
um, alongside the smaller uses that are out there that growers are learning of opportunities uh, from state DOTs or state parks or whatever, whatever entity or cities, municipalities, um, learning uh, where the demand is and uh, tailoring their production to, to some of that demand because it, it can become part of their business model um, and, and part of their production. So Heather, I think we have a. a I still think it would be more effective to plant islands of, you know, juvenile plants and let them seed into the landscape, because, like I said, for many species, we are to produce the pound of seedage that they're used. To. I've been to all the native seed conferences, you know, national native seed conferences. What they're doing out west, to be able to do that here we're a long way. And so, and, and it's true when you broadcast the seed, most of it's wasted. Do we really want to do that with our limited, you know, it's shocking the loss of, you know, what were common wildflowers 40 years ago, you know. Well, let, let me take another tact. Um, the reality is, is that all of these uh, municipal, state, federal entities, large entities, are staging large-scale projects out in the environment, and they're largely using maladapted seed because, to, you know, whether you're doing a, a small little pollinator garden in your backyard, or you're doing, uh, you know, 20 miles of right-of-way along a state road, um, you're all in the same boat. You're all wanting local ecotypic. Uh, material, but you can't get it. And so they're going to Ernst too. Um, so whether we like it or not, huge amounts of seed uh, and plant material are going out into the environment and large portions of it is maladapted. Um, and so its net effect on, on uh, nature is very dramatic and that's not gonna stop these, these uh, all these large users are going to continue to demand and use seed. Um, Ed, sorry to interrupt. Okay, I see Hope and Uli. So Hope, would you like to uh, go first and then Uli afterwards? You have to mute yourself. Um, sure, this this does verge into what Uli is supposed to be talking about anyway, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to throw out some numbers um, of, of actual projects that I've been involved in um, to just sort of frame um, the conversation a little bit. Um, these were uh, coastal projects, um, salt marsh, thin layer deposition. So sand was added on top of a salt marsh to increase the elevation to um, create more habitat and high marsh habitat, habitat for salt marsh nesting birds and, and in effect create high marsh habitat and, and dune essentially. Um, and so um, one of them um, that um, was 20, the whole restoration site or um, modification site was 20 acres in size. Um, and within that, five acres were planted with plugs um, and there were 97,000 plugs planted over the course of two years. Um, so the cost of that was, um, you know, pretty, pretty staggering. It was funded by NOAA and, and you know, federal funding there for that. Um, but just in terms of the, the volume of plant material and, the effort was made to um, use locally collected seed because it came at a time it was it was funded through the Sandy Relief Project um, after Hurricane Sandy, so it was also tied into the native seed collecting that went on by the Native Plant Center and the Mid Atlantic um, Regional Seed Bank um, to collect seed along the coast. Um, for these restorations. But even with that, um, a percentage came from the Mid-Atlantic region because we could not meet the need 
um, to produce all of those plant plugs um, going through a, a, a southern located nursery. Um, so there, these were little islands that were planted um, in this particular instance, most of the other area filled in on its own. And in a coastal situation, it would have been impractical to put seed down anyway, because it would just get washed away and, and relocated um, throughout the, the um, restoration site. But um, over time, the bulk of that, over the course of, of two growing seasons, the bulk of that area has reseeded itself and the pop the little islands have become quite um, vigorous islands but the scale is you know for many of these restorations is has been on the scale of 20 to 45 acres 50 acres so there is quite a volume that is needed in in either plugs or seed okay, um, great. okay. um Uli, we'll have you share, and then I'm going to reshare um, the cycle just so everyone can get a reminder of what that looks like. And since we only have a half an hour left, then we'll do um, seed storage and restoration. But Uli, is there something that you'd like to say now? Well, I mean, I, I think that that both Heather and Ed are correct in terms of uh, of, of the different approaches, and and it's and you're kind of caught in a, an unfortunate juxtaposition in that. Um, I, I strongly agree that seed, and particularly wild collected seed, is a precious natural resource that shouldn't go to waste. Yet, um, the scale of some of the larger projects, as Hope has, has, has uh, outlined for us, um, generally doesn't make it feasible to produce live plants to put out, and not to mention there are few nurseries, and, and I know this from, from our own nursery operation, that are equipped to produce you know, 100,000 plugs or more of a particular species for these massive projects. And, and, and short of that, that, that is why you need the, you know, pounds and hundreds of pounds scale of uh, ecotypic seed available for those sorts of projects. But I also think that we shouldn't discount the market for, uh, for smaller applications where uh, you know, selling individual seed packets can also be very economically viable and ways to get this uh, uh, um, important plant material out into uh, uh, on smaller scale projects, uh, backyards, uh, uh, gardens, these sorts of things. Um, so there, you know, we're really caught in between the two. Uh, and there, and as, and as Ed has pointed out in the beginning that um, much of our, um, supply chain is, is underinvested, um, and we haven't really even touched upon what's needed for um, processing seed at that scale and storage of seed at that scale um, and, and the lack of facilities to do that. Um, and you know, and I, I don't want to get away from the fact that there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm for doing this on a smaller scale, but we also need to think about putting these pieces together so that we can meet the needs of the, the DOTs and the federal governments and the municipalities, along with the great desire that is there for home gardeners and garden clubs and, and individuals to want to use this seed. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that because um, I, I think my portion at the end about, about Ecological restoration seems like a natural place to carry on this discussion of, of what are the available markets and end users for this kind of seed. Um, and I will say, I think Sarah had her, uh, had her hand up too, so I'll just pass the mic over to her real quick. Okay, Sarah, I'm just going to, while, you, while you're sharing, I'm going to reshare my screen, so go ahead. Okay. So, super quick, um, actually agreeing with everything that's been said, but this is species specific. And we really should be planting common early successional species that are fairly easy to produce like wild rye and purple top. You probably can do many pounds of something like that. Right, that's a great point. And I think that's also what's used in, as filler in a lot of those seed mixes. So um, in an effort for time, because we only have a half an hour left and I really think that it'll be a great conversation um, to have everyone a part of in terms of discussing the network. We skipped around a little bit, but we'll quickly go over 
the seed storage components that Uli was just referencing. And then we'll talk about um, restoring native plant communities as well that um, Uli was also alluring to. And then we'll get into um, the full roundtable discussion around what we need to do to actually fortify this network. So Ed, if you wanna talk quickly about the seed storage and its um, opportunities and challenges, that would be great. I think you're on mute, Ed. Sorry about that. Um, so we're talking about storage at two scales. Um, and I would really call it seed banking and seed warehousing. Uh, the seed that we collect in the wild, um, well, first of all, in the Northeast, the, you know, we are in high humid uh, conditions uh, and seed storage uh, for uh, orthodox seed, which is roughly 75 to 90% of all species, um, means drying that seed down and to roughly around 15% relative humidity. It varies um, somewhat species to species. And then the lower the temperature that you're storing it at, the more uh, stable that seed is. We seed bank at my facility um, and we can safely keep seed uh, for decades at a time. Some of these very fancy seed banks that we've all heard about, um, whether it's the Royal, uh, Millennium Seed Bank in, at Kew in England or the USDA uh, Seed Bank in Fort Collins, um, tend to store at very lower temperatures um, and that keeps seed stable for indefinitely, perhaps for millennia. Um, and, and the two kinds of seed banking are towards two different goals. And I like to use the analogy of those big fancy seed banks are there. Um, as Noah's Ark, they're, they're repositories for um, seed of species, particularly that are uh, in danger of being lost, um, either as a species or populations. And so it's Noah's Ark, it's a place where you can put seed and uh, safely store it for long periods of time. Uh, the kind of seed banking I practice at my facility is called active seed banking. It's at more modest temperatures. And I like to use the analogy of that kind of a seed bank as your local savings and loan. It's a place where um, many, many users can deposit their seed and uh, it remains your seed, um, but it's stored under ideal conditions that are not necessarily possible, um, you know, for a lot of, uh, you know, for the vast majority of people out there. So it's regionalizing uh, a, a service, uh, keeping seed stable and available. Um, it also plays an important function of, you know, we, we talked about how important sourcing is. So everything, we, we manage our seed bank just like a museum manages its collection. So every single collection that we make or that others deposit is a session with a unique number. Um, and, and so we maintain that as individual collections. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in seed of a particular species from a particular ecoregion, um, it's all record keeped in that sort of way so that it can be drawn on and used. And so uh, typically we have a couple thousand collections in our seed bank at any one time, but we've made probably 12 to 14,000 collections over 25 years. And that's because we're constantly drawing down on that uh, seed for production purposes. So um, seed banking of wild seed is important um, to keep it stable and not wasted. But secondly, again, because we are dealing with a highly fragmented uh, natural world and these populations are vital resources um, that are, uh, in danger of being overexploited or um, misused, um, that there needs there needs to be some sort of refereeing of uh, of that seed supply. We need to make sure that it's not just helter skelter and everyone's going out there um, overexploiting uh, local populations. So I, I would argue that seed banking is best done. Uh, at a regional level um, as part of a network and, and 
uh, getting that seed out to all that need it. When you bulk seed, when you go through these, these, this process that Polly described of, of doing seed increase and, and that you know, Dina is doing at a certain scale, um, you're producing bulk seed uh, that has a bigger, uh, just needs a bigger volume of storage. Here in the Northeast, because uh, I mean, I've been to seed, uh, to seed warehouses in the West uh, for instance, in the state of Utah, where all they're really, you know, it's just a big warehouse essentially, and all they're doing is air conditioning it because the, the ambient uh, relative humidity in Utah is so low that um, the seed can stay stable, but we don't have that luxury in the Northeast. If we want to produce bulk seed and have it available for these large projects, we need to be able to warehouse it uh, under the appropriate conditions so that um, as these projects get staged, they can they have a ready supply. Uh, it, given the length of time that it takes to produce uh, bulk seed, and especially in quantities, um, it's, it's not possible to be thinking about this and looking for it just months before you intend to do your work. We really need to to uh, warehouse seed. And of course, if we're gonna do that, it's going to have to be a cooperative effort because it's, it's not cheap um, to, to run a warehouse. Uh, and in the West, uh, again, I've visited several of these. They're quite large. Uh, the state of Utah runs a seed warehouse um, that can hold um, a million pounds of seed uh, at any one time. We do not have any seed warehouses that uh, of really any substantial side in the entire Eastern United States. Um, and so this is something that's going to require uh, an investment. I, I Certainly not by small growers in the Northeast, it's going to have to be a regional um, effort, perhaps funded by federal agencies or the like uh, to make it possible, but it, but it is necessary. There would be nothing worse than uh, going through the effort of doing all this increase and having that seed deteriorate before it got back out in the landscape. Great, thank you so much, Ed. I think that um, expresses to all of us that there is a lot of opportunity there and a lot of things in the supply chain that can be built upon. Perhaps someone in this audience is enticed by that. Um, we'll move on quickly to Uli. And Uli, I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to you with a question we have from Michael Whitmore who says, can we safely assume that EPA eco regions are safe to share seed or should we test genetics in some way prior to scaling up? Um, can we use, he said the example of, um, can we use Long Island ecotypes on Martha's Vineyard? Uh, they're looking at wind dissemination, like warm season grasses. And I asked Uli that question because this last topic is restoring native plant communities. So perhaps we can um, speak quickly to that and then have our forming a network conversation. Uli? Sure. Um... So yeah, I mean, I think that that um, the example that Michael is citing is is exactly the kind of thing that we would like to see happen, where seed transfers within uh, an eco region. In this case, the the uh, you know uh, coastal pine barrens regions that are out on Long Island, that also um, you know very similar plant communities that exist on on Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Cape Cod. And I think it would be a, a, a very appropriate source for for warm season grasses um, if you can't find anything from uh, from the Cape or, or sources closer. Um, and yeah, so it's same same eco region, I think. Um, what I what I wanted to do just uh, just to take a step back um, uh, before I before I move forward with, with restoration things is that I think that um, I also want to kind of bring up the the topic of of morals and ethics in this higher in this whole process, and it and it's something that that I actually wanted to make this comment when Hope was just describing the wild seed collecting process, um, and and that there are established protocols that are in place to ensure that we do as little harm to natural populations, and what that means sometimes is that 
you find the plant you're looking for and there just isn't enough seed for you to take. And it's really hard to like, you know, to put your hand back in your pockets and say, okay, I'm going to walk away, uh, even though I've gone through all this effort. Um, and just in the same way that, that um, you know, Ed talks about the, the ethical use of the seeds, um, this is something that has to kind of suffuse into all steps of this that uh, in order for us to, to make sure that the end product is as genetically diverse as possible and that we're not um, uh, damaging the landscape in, in our pursuit of this, uh, we have to adhere to our moral ethical code. And I think that is that needs to be said in this whole process as well. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I also think that, that, that you know, Heather and Sarah uh, and, and certainly Dina's ex experiences um, point to um, the use for, for really common species uh, as a great way to start, uh, and particularly with, with ecological restorations. Many ecological restorations are taking place on uh, disturbed lands or degraded lands where um, putting in the rare plant or even the uncommon plant doesn't really make sense because we're talking about things where uh, uh, disturbance has set the successional clock back. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of jargon going on here. I, I, would, I would recommend people first and foremost look into what is plant succession. And in a nutshell, it's the process by which uh, um, natural communities uh, succeed one another to some sort of a, a, a stable state uh, or stable state in the sense of, of the, the degree of, of disturbance is very long. So, uh, for example, the Pine Barrens, it's a fire adapted ecology and where uh, burn cycles are meant to happen uh, relatively frequently, which keeps open habitat and favors a diverse plant community. Uh, in forested regions, perhaps that disturbance cycle might be centuries. Um, but what we're living in is such a fragmented landscape that uh, um, the successional clock is being set back all the time and all the different activities that we do, um, whether it's, it's you know, the, the DOT project or uh, we cut down a forest to build a subdivision and now we're looking to restore the edge habitat that was left behind by the real estate developer. Um, this is where common early successional species really uh, uh, lift their weight and help to set the stage for future uh, succession to happen. Um, and the reason I'm sort of harping on this is because many of them are actually fairly easy to grow. Um, and I think people would have a, a, a lot of success getting their toes wet in growing things like the wild rise or little blue stems or some of the asters. Um, I do think a certain amount of knowledge about um, how to treat the seeds and so forth is really crucial. Um, the thing that, that I think surprises many people just as a specific example are oak trees all right they're very common but acorns do not store at all they have to be planted fresh and so this is not something that you can think i'm going to you know i'm going to gather you know 50 pounds of acorns and expect to come back to them in five years and plant them um there's there's different uh, as we've said there's different approaches to this um so starting off with common species um, I also want to make a plea for, um, particularly in ecological restorations, um, the functions that these species perform in their various plant communities. And we're sort of naturally drawn to the pretty and the showy and the, and the beautiful, gorgeous, big flower and wildflowers. And we may overlook things like sedges or rushes and things that uh, are really a, a, an important backbone to, uh, to a functioning ecosystem. Um, and so our, our approach needs to be not just the pretty things that attract pollinators, but also maybe the things that are less interesting or less aesthetic, or maybe even just banal that, you know, you don't quite understand why that plant is there, but it plays a role. Um, so, um, and then, you know, as I said before, the, the, the developing the different markets, I think is also going to be an important uh, end goal for the network and for anybody who's interested in, in doing this kind of work. Um, you know, we've seen that uh, from a small scale uh, all the way up through DOT projects, buffer strips. I think uh, buffer strips are a, a really important thing where farmers can get involved in using some of this seed 
uh, and helping to support local pollinator uh, um, uh, populations by planting it back onto the landscape uh, around larger fields. Um, solar farms, we get a lot of interest at, at Native Plant Trust for seed for solar farms and they need it to be a certain height and they don't want to use just regular grass and they don't want to mow and, and spend the money to mow. Um, but the scale again of these projects is something where you're going to need to have bulk seed available uh, and, and producing um, plugs or live plants just isn't really economically feasible. Um, you know, I, I just want to, because I do want to leave some time for the discussion. I, I'm, I'm just really thrilled that this group is here and that we're having this conversation and particularly in the context of the NOFA conference. Um, and it's long overdue here in the Northeast. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that um, the momentum that we've generated here uh, can carry forward into some real um, positive actionable steps in the future. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Seth, for today. Um, Thank you, Lily. That is a, that's a perfect transition. Um, I realize folks, it's getting late and some of you might have to sign off, but um, as Uli said, you know, we're gonna talk about forming the network, but Dina has put in a survey into the chat and our hope there is that we, if you want to stay involved as this network is forming, if you want to be a part of it, we'd love to know who you are, where you are, um, any comments or questions that we weren't able to get to during this session. So please, before you leave, um, please do fill out that survey. And I also want to mention that for anyone interested in implementing this on their farm, on Friday of this conference from one to four, we will have the Ecotypic Seed School. Uh, Hope and Polly will be presenting on theory and Michael from the Native Bell, um, from the nursery with Ed and Alexis from Native Plant Trust will be teaching the, the practical side of those things. So we do hope you join, that, join us for that. So with our last 10 or 12 minutes or so, I open it up to everyone. Now we've kind of gone through the cycle. We see where we're at in the Northeast. Um, and I think it's really encouraging and would love to hear all your thoughts on the importance of this network and what some actionable steps may be towards that end. So go ahead, anyone. Um, Ed, no. oh, oh, Polly, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I've been um, working on this initiative through the Native Plant Initiative for many, many years, almost. 20 already, um, how did 20 years fly by, but, and, and I know that many others that are on this call have been doing the same. And, you know, for me, I see the next step as being, how do we, how can we unify the work that we're doing and complement each other's work, um, focusing on the strengths that we each have, but also focusing on where um, those strengths that others have would help us. So for the Native Plant Initiative, as Michael had um, had asked about, um, you know, whether or not we could, he could utilize seed that we had produced on Long Island within his projects. You know, I think those are really important questions to ask um, where we could, you know, complement the work that we're doing and also continue to help expand the availability of a diversity of native plants that are available instead of investing efforts into species that we already have on the market um, and evaluate that moving forward. Um, you know, I know the Native Plant Trust and, and Hope and, and Heather and, uh, you know, they've, we've all worked together to create, you know, focus on many of the same species, but also many of the different species and not had this opportunity to extend, you know, a larger working effort. You know, we've all communicated to one another and, and talked and we, we know each other well, but we haven't had uh, someone like yourself, Sifra, who has, you know, brought us all together to try to engage in a larger conversation. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, it, it's very exciting to see you all together. As I said before, you're all seed liberties to me. Ed, Ed, go for it. Um, well, as I think everyone that's participated can see, it's, it's a vast, hugely, uh, complicated in some ways uh, series of steps and factors and you know as we touched on every one of these it seemed to open uh, you know a can of worms with uh, 16 more things to discuss about that so I, I I think you know what I what I would hope for and encourage is is um, 
the, the notion of continuing this discussion either you know in some periodic fashion just by uh, you know simply establishing some kind of a online meeting place uh, whether it's monthly or quarterly to begin with or what but there I'm, I'm sure there's a million questions out there from the 41 participants and um you know there's no one answer to any any one of these things um and i think the important thing is to is to begin the dialogue to begin the discussion uh and you know and that's what i would encourage uh to take place i would certainly be willing to continue excuse me, to continue uh, to participate in a forum of that nature. And perhaps uh, in a post-COVID world, we can actually think about um, all gathering someplace for a more uh, extended, you know, multiple day uh, conversation about all this because there's just so much to talk about. It's so true. And um, there's a question for Dina, but hope I see your hand. Up. Do you want to go first, Hope? Sure. Thanks. Um, one of the things that um, that some of us have talked about, and I think is important for people in the audience to think about, is um, the idea of working cooperatively. Um, much of this requires. I mean, for the work I've been doing, and and I know um, that Heather does, and 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 to some extent, Polly, although she's launched it into some bigger equipment, the seed cleaning is, is really small scale. Um, and in order to meet these kinds of demands, the need is for larger equipment and, and um, that includes a, a heavy investment. And so how do we work collectively to share equipment because it's not being used all the time. There are things that are available at, at seed materials centers, but they're not local to here, to New England or the Northeast. Um, some universities have things in warehouses that could be resurrected. Um, so there are potential opportunities out there. Um, and I think that people in their own communities, in their own grower communities, um, if you're interested, seeking those out and um, is an important first step as well to, to um, trying to build this um, chain of, of supply. Thanks, Hope. Um, Dina, would you like to address the questions in regards to farming and profitability in terms of this? Sure, sure I can speak to that. Um, we, I am as a grower pretty new, as I said, in this space, um, but one of the things that is really encouraging for me as um, a business person in this space um, is how much, um, maybe this is putting it indelicately, but how, how much these gaps create a uh, market for me. <laughs> so the fact that there isn't a lot of seed production means that a small seed farmer is really the only show in town when it comes to ecotypic seed. Um, I would also say for many of us who are growers thinking of entering into this space, um, the sale of seed is not something I'm going to quit my day job over. Um, but the addition of growing some of these plant plugs for retail sale um, has proven so far um, for us on a very small scale um, to be a pretty profitable um, enterprise. We are involved with nursery growers um, and I think they are finding the market, this emerging market to be one um, that is really worth some of the nursery growers investing in um, on that side. However, those nursery growers need a couple of small seed farmers as well. Um, so I think, you know, the gaps that we are seeing in this supply chain really are, for me, opportunities. And we've talked about whether or not you as a grower want to be focused on the common plants or whether you want to be focused on the rare plants, whether you want to be focused on retail seed sales or wholesale seed sales or retail plant sales. There's just so many different sort of avenues to choose your own adventure in this space. Um, but I also think, and this has come up a little bit in the chat as well, this is not a particularly um, 
wide net that we are casting. There are huge gaps in terms of where urban growers may fit in, um, indigenous growers, growers of color. I mean, there's just so much opportunity um, for us to create a richer um, network that really does kind of reflect the landscape um, that we're all trying to restore. Uh, so I feel like, you know, as, as many challenges as there are in this conversation, um, I, am, I am leaving this evening um, just about as, as energized as I've ever been <laughs> to start um, to expand and, and, and learn um, in, this, in this field. There's just, um, I think the sky's the limit really right now. Yeah, and to echo that, Dina, we're so excited to be bringing as many different people and groups into this conversation by offering this seed school to encourage the growing of ecotypic seed where, wherever folks may be. So hopefully that session on Friday will um, allow us to cast that wider net and have this be in um, more areas. And was there anyone else on the round table who wanted to Ed, go for it. There was an interesting confluence between, you know, my own thinking on this and uh, meeting Sephra and Dina in that I, um, Sephra mentioned at the beginning, I, I am part of a committee of the National Academy of Sciences uh, looking into the problem of seed supply across the United States. and. Um, there are giant seed companies in the West, uh, which tend to dominate the discussion there. Um, and they're not interested in growing local ecotypic seed because it doesn't fit their business model. And so it just seems at every turn, um, uh, you know, I've heard from large to mid-sized growers and, and just having a real difficulty with this idea of local. Um, and the more and more I thought about it, I started to think about uh, organic farmers and small farmers and um, things like, you know, interest in, in local produce and, and uh, uh, you know, conserving locally and producing locally. And it started to get, get me to thinking uh, perhaps a better model of the kind of grower that's needed um, for what we're talking about here is a small to mid-sized grower who shares values of uh, conservation and, and supporting pollinators and all these things. So I was really happy to start this discussion or to hear that this group in Connecticut was, you know, was working with, uh, with small growers. And I, you know, and I, I think um, you know, that all these markets are possible and that a smart grower will exploit as many of these as fits their business model. And I do think, as Gina said, it's kind of wide open right now. The good news is you don't have giant international seed companies breathing down your neck and, and actively um, trying to stop you from going into this business in the Northeast. That is the case, uh, I would say, in the West, um, that there's active uh, you know, efforts to, to see that, that ecotypic seed is not, does not become the norm. Uh, so I, I think, uh, yes, we're underdeveloped, um, but there's opportunity in that as well. And I would just add, I work for the Central Pine Barrens Commission as my full-time job. And, you know, in my position of advancing restoration, both uh, ecological restoration through prescribed fire and also restoring sites that have been encroached upon through development that, you know, we have the, a very challenging, um, um, we're uh, just very challenged to find these plant materials. And, you know, I started Limpy um, and working in the previous job of recognizing that need. And I think by us working collectively, you know, I saw some questions about uh, native plants and, and what we're focusing on. And, it, and I would say that we're not only focusing on um, common plants, but we're also trying to coordinate and focus on uh, ethnobotanical species, as well as species that have um, additional utilitarian purposes um, that are related to the Native Americans and our use in that capacity and, and other, um, other uh, peoples as well. And you know, I, I pride myself on um, helping those restore the landscape, especially as we continue to fragment 
our landscape. And that's another challenge that we have uniquely in the Northeast that we don't have, that the West doesn't necessarily have. And so I think the work that we're all doing together, um, you know, I think there, there's great gain and there's great pride in being able to uh, advance a restoration using uh, this genetically uh, drive seed that we've all worked collectively to utilize in our restorations to repair the damage that we have inadvertently caused. Thank you so much, Polly. I realize we are at 8.01 and um, wherever you all are, these beautiful embryos, these seeds that we all care so much for and caretake, um, as, as many people on this call who want to join in this effort to help reduce fragmentation, put these right plants in the right place and ensure our living seed banks can proliferate from all those that came before us, for all those that shall come after us. Uh, we really do hope that you stay in touch with the survey that you join on at Seed School. Um, to all these people at the round table and to all of the wonderful work you do throughout the region, um, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. And for all the attendees as well, um, yeah, hopefully we'll meet you in person at some point, but thank you for taking this evening to discuss this with us. And hopefully this is the beginning of a really wonderful network that can help um, supply all people throughout the Northeast and be a model throughout, throughout the country and the world of how we can help amplify these truly local native plants um, for restoration and for all the good things. So have a wonderful night, everyone. And my email I'll put into the chat if I can help fill in any gaps and um, I'll stay on for a bit longer, but thank you so much. <laughs>